Hi everybody, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Welcome to a, another exciting uh, live stream. I, I'm a, uh, this is one that I'm really excited about. I'll tell you why exactly I'm excited about this one in particular. I mean, you know that I try to stream, you know, once or twice a month. Uh, just streamed last week or a week out from the Starship third launch, which was obviously extremely exciting. Uh, not gonna be able to quite probably top that one today, although it is a return to launch site landing, which makes it incredible. It's going to the International Space Station, makes it incredible. It is a very exciting launch. Um, so, we've got some stuff to do. We've got some pre-launch previewing to do. Um, let's do that. Let's pop on over. If you, Anytime you guys want to know what's going to be happening on any mission, that's, well, not every mission, but most missions we have a pre-launch preview article for. Um, so if you want to know, you know, where is this going? Why? All, all, so many of the questions we always see, like, what is Dragon 2? I just saw that one go by a little bit ago. Uh, we've got it. So head on over to everydayastronaut.com, click on upcoming articles, and you will see our pre-launch previews. So this is uh, scheduled to take off here in about 25 minutes already. Uh, today, March 21st, 2024, uh, this is a Dragon for the CRS-2, the second round of commercial resupply missions. Um, it's SpaceX-30, so it's, it's also known as CRS-30. Um, it's confusing because CRS, there's like two there's CRS and CRS-2 like contracts, and then SpaceX-30, but it's also known as CRS-30, so that's if you're wondering why or what, that's why. Um, a commercial resupply service to the International Space Station or the ISS. The launch provider for this, this is a SpaceX launch with a SpaceX uh, spacecraft, but the customer for this is NASA. NASA, this is the whole commercial resupply program is NASA paying uh, private companies to send things to the International Space Station um, because it's proven to be cheaper, redundant. There's, you know, multiple companies doing this and there's soon to be a third company um, doing this outside of Northrop and SpaceX and that'll be Sierra Nevada. Uh, very exciting, honestly. Uh, the rocket for this, this is Falcon 9 uh, Block 5 booster, is booster B1080, which is a pretty new new little baby. It's only uh, uh, it's only flown six times, so it's just a fresh just a fresh little booster, you know, um, which is crazy these days. That's like, oh, it's only flown six times when, you know, some of the other fleets, you know, 18 plus times. It's absolutely crazy. It's just nuts that we're having to get used to that already uh, the launch location for this this is so i just learned this um and uh it's it's crazy that i didn't even i did not realize that they have not launched dragon 2 from slick 40 until like three minutes ago and in discord we've been talking about it. i don't know how i never realized that dragon 2 has never flown from slick 40 until today this will be the first time so this is taking off from slick 40 which is the og pad for spacex uh besides vandenberg uh, but the the OG pad out at the um, at, out at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, uh, and of course you know it's Cape Canaveral because it's Slick 40 and not LC uh, 39 or LC, which would just be Launch Complex. So Space Launch Complex means it's at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station and not Kennedy Space Center. The payload mass is not specified. Where is the spacecraft going? It's going to uh, it'll rendezvous and and dock with the International Space Station, which is approximately at 400 kilometers, so 250 miles in altitude. Will it be attempting to recover the first stage? Yes. Uh, where will it be landing? At landing zone one. So back at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Super exciting. Expect fantastic views today. It looks like it's a crystal clear sky. Just absolutely perfect. Um, the uh, Are there fairings? No, there are no fairings on Dragon. Dragon is its own self-contained you know, spacecraft. Does not need to have fairings. So it's, it's very similar to the crew capsule. Uh, same basic vehicle same you know pressure vessel uh just not doesn't have all the uh the fittings for human space flight so it's missing you know uh even abort thrusters life support all those things that that would make it uh you know capable of, of flying humans it does not have that because it doesn't need it it's just flying cargo this will be the 313th falcon 9 launch the 27th falcon 9 flight with a fal uh or 27th falcon 9 mission this year that's insane already. We're not even three. We're not even through March. Yeah, they're they're on track already for well over a hundred missions this year. I mean, that's on that's on pace for 120 or so, even more, maybe 120, 120, 130, and that's accelerating. So maybe by the end of the month, or end of the year, it'll be 
This is crazy. <laughs> it's just so weird. This is so different than when I first started covering this stuff. Like these numbers, I, they sometimes they just catch me off guard. Like right now, 240. This is the 242nd Falcon 9 flight with a flight proven booster. Again, I was there for the first time they flew a booster for, with SES 10. Would have never imagined that would be by far the majority of launches would be on flight proven boosters. Crazy, crazy town, crazy town. Uh, this is the 256th reflight of a booster. Um, this is the 25th, um, because don't forget there's Falcon Heavy reflight boosters. 25th reflight of a booster this year, so of course, uh, pretty much all of them. Uh, 286 booster landing, 212th consecutive landing, which is insane. 28th launch for SpaceX this year, because um, don't forget we had a Starship mission. Uh, just a week ago, like I said, 327th SpaceX mission altogether, 174th SpaceX launch from this launch pad, fourth flight of a Dragon 2, uh, of, of this particular Dragon 2, which is C-209, and the 55th orbital launch attempt of the year. So SpaceX still coming in at almost half of the total launches, um, but not quite, not quite half. Uh, the thing that I'm really excited, the thing that made me go, finally, okay, so who here in chat, who here saw those high definition, you know, high quality footage, uh, the imagery of Starship re-entering in that plasma field. And we're just like, this is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And it makes you go, why aren't there more incredible images from space? Like we're in the 21st century. This is 2020, what is it, four? <laughs> I already forgot. Who saw that image and was like, finally, finally there's awesome imagery of something like this. And have you ever thought, why isn't there better footage from the International Space Station? So much of that stuff looks like it's potato camera. I learned about this. Finally, a company called Sen is sending up 4K cameras. I mean, of course, there's been 4K cameras up on the ISS, obviously. But this is different. These are actually going to be doing 4K live streams from the International Space Station, able to get things like docking, um, they're providing cameras that are looking at Earth's horizon, uh, the surface. So there's actually, I believe there's three being launched in this first one. Um, yeah, so arrangement allows cameras to cover footage of Earth's horizon surface and the forward-facing docking port. Um, and so, yeah, and a camera's going to pr provide a panoramic view of the horizon. This is something that I've wanted forever. There just isn't anything decent <laughs> like at all for for this kind of stuff. And when I learned that this, someone is finally doing this, you know, there's incredible, you know, apps and stuff telling you where the ISS is and some, you know, live stream, live stream footage of, from the ISS, but it's never, never good. Uh, this just, I don't know why. This is one of those things, this is a bringing space down to earth for everyday people type of thing that just made me really excited. Uh, I'm, I'm wanting to talk to these guys and this is just like, yes, finally, yes. Uh, I, and I, I, my understanding is they're even going to be doing an app, yeah, like a Send app, where you'll be able to just click and watch it. I don't know if it's a paid thing or free. I think it's. I think I saw that it was free, even, which is really really cool. Um, so yeah, get that get that app, and hopefully once these cameras go online, you can just in theory just watch streams from the ISS in real time ish. You know, as real time as you can get with latency. I'm just excited about that. That's that's the one that made me think that this is cool. But there's a, a bunch of other things like. Um, a CubeSat that's going to be deployed from there, um, this uh, multi-resolution scanner, a handful of other things. Sorry, I'm, I feel bad for all the scientists that are like doing incredible things, and I'm like, there's cameras! But that's, that is just me. That is just me. Um, but yeah, so if you want to learn more about this, check out our pre-launch preview. Here's kind of the a few of the things that that particular rocket has done, this particular booster, and this particular spacecraft. Um, yeah. That's what we're looking at. Everyone say thank you to Flo for writing this article. Um, okay, I've got another question for you all. How many of you wanted to hear my thoughts afterwards of, of what went on with Flight 3 of Starship? How many of you were like, hey, Tim, I want to hear your thoughts on Flight 3 from Starship. I'm sure I've already seen the comments that there already are people asking, what would you think of you know the thrusters and people saying, you know, your question from Elon to Elon ruined that, that launch and stuff. Um, okay, good news, great news. If you are one of those people that wanted to hear my thoughts on Flight 3 and just hear casual conversation about rockets, I have a beautiful thing for you, a free 
podcast that you can find right now anywhere you listen to podcasts, except for some reason it's not popping up in Google Play Podcasts, but Google Podcasts are going down in like two weeks anyway, so maybe they're not even populating new podcasts. Anyway, Spacewalk. I have a new podcast. It's very casual. It's me just... The idea is it's too hard for me to schedule being here in the seat or even with decent internet. Like, I can't always do live streams. I can't... It be, was really hard for me to do the podcast with my friends Ben and Joe with Our Ludicrous Future. Love them to death. But in 2021, like when I just decided it was too hard, I was gone almost 300 days of the year. So this, people keep asking, like, Tim, we just want to hear your thoughts on this or that or just, you know, a casual conversation, you know, just random things. And why aren't you talking about this? And it's like, well, I, I, I'm on the go. I don't have, like, what am I supposed to be, like, in a hotel room, you know, like with crappy Wi-Fi with the Internet, you know, like a, a hotel Wi-Fi. So now I have a dedicated space pod, or space pod, well, yeah, that too, uh, a, a, a podcast called Spacewalk. You can find it on, there's a dedicated channel for YouTube. There's also uh, anywhere you find it. So just Spacewalk, maybe you might have to type in Everyday Astronaut to find it, but hopefully it pops up on Spotify, you know, Apple Podcasts, wherever else you listen. Um, yeah, and you can find it at youtube.com slash um, at Spacewalk Podcast, you'll find it. But I have 22 minutes of me talking about Starship Flight 3. Very casual. I'm literally on the go during it. I was in the O'Hare airport when I recorded it. And that's the idea with this is just to make it, um, you know, simpler and easier to record and just have it be very casual. Just a, a literally like you and I hanging out, um, having fun together and just not be formal about it. Not have to not have this huge high production value like I normally do. You guys know I'm obsessed with quality. Uh, quality over quantity. This will be quantity over quality, just so you can get some some stuff to entertain you while you're on your drive to work, or you know, while you're walking to class, or whatever you may be doing. There you go. So enjoy. Okay, so let's see. We are waiting still for the feeds to show up. Oh, it is up. It is up. I talked too long. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, let me get this all set up here on my end. Um, I oh, it's finally good. Isn't it funny that ironically now uh, NASA is one of the high quality stuff <laughs> we're actually getting. Um, 4k feeds from them so one second here uh what is going on why is it like let me fit that to screen and then it'll look much better uh there we go turning off closed captions adding sound and we will go live right now with this here we go mm, you guys can't hear that one second here let me make sure that's the right I was so excited that I set this up so early. Uh, this might be what was wrong. Okay, can you guys hear that? Give me a thumbs up if you hear audio now. Sitting atop the Falcon 9, the Dragon spacecraft and its trunk stand over 26 feet tall. The nose cone op opens shortly oh, after launch to expose the four bulkhead <laughs> thrusters and docking net mechanism that will connect with the station. Dragon is headed for the Zenith docking port on the station, which was just vacated by Crew 7, which came home last week. Dragon's trunk holds solar cells, which power Dragon while it's in free flight. The trunk can also carry unpressurized cargo, which it will be doing today. Dragon has 16 thrusters that can be used in space to help navigate the spacecraft to its destination, which each, with each thruster providing about 90 pounds of force. The Dragon spacecraft has played a significant role in advancing our future in space by safely transporting crew and cargo to and from the space station. There are currently four Dragon spacecraft supports. by SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket, which provides 1.7 million Oh. I hear it now, but I don't think you guys hear it. Gosh, what is going on? 
will again reignite to oh, help yeah. slow Falcon 9 down as it prepares to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Finally, the landing bird, I don't know what's where going the on. center engine of the Falcon Was 9 it will fixed? slow down. You guys can hear me now? Enough to perform a precision landing okay, I can't hear anything, though. That's that's one. my problem now. Meanwhile, the second uh, stage continues to orbit, powered by a single Merlin vacuum talking. engine with over 220,000 pounds of thrust. The second stage will secure Dragon's entry into low Earth orbit before separating, leaving Dragon to continue its own journey to the space station on its own thrusters. About 50 seconds after separation, Dragon's nose cone deployment sequence will begin, exposing its guidance navigation controls that help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. With T0 coming up in about 12 minutes, our teams at the Cape and Hangar X are doing a series of system checks to ensure Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready to fly. Reusability is key to making spacecraft space flight more routine and ultimately what will enable humans to become multiplanetary. Down at Starbase, Texas, we are continuing to build, test, and fly Starship, the world's most powerful launch vehicle ever developed. One week ago today, Starship returned to integrated flight testing with its third launch from Starbase. This flight achieved several milestones and firsts. Super Heavy completed its second full duration ascent burn, the, su the second successful hot stage separation, a successful flip mover maneuver, and this time made it through the boost back burn and attempted its first ever landing burn. Starship executed its first full duration ascent burn, making it to space and checking off several other test objectives, including opening and closing its payload door, AKA the PEZ dispenser, and initiating a propellant transfer demonstration and its first re-entry through the atmosphere. Starship brought never before seen live views of this atmospheric re-entry, utilizing the Starlink terminals installed on board to transmit a live high definition video signal, even as plasma built around it. Starship's rapid development approach has been the basis for all of SpaceX's major innovative advancements, including on Falcon, Dragon, and Starlink. Testing and learning is essential as we work to build a fully reusable transportation system capable of carrying both crew and cargo to Earth orbit to help humanity return to the moon and ultimately to travel to Mars and beyond. Building bases or even cities will require huge amounts of cargo and eventually crew, and that's where Starship comes in. In partnership with NASA, Starship will serve as the lander to put the first Artemis astronauts on the moon. The vehicle will perform one uncrewed demonstration flight before the Artemis III mission, which will be the first human surface expedition since 1972. With the ability to deliver cargo and people to the lunar surface, we'll be ready to help humanity build a sustainable presence on the moon and learn how to live off world before the next step to Mars. Starship is now getting ready for its fourth test flight. Every launch and mission yields critical data for continuing to improve and pave the way for our future in space, and Flight 4 will continue that journey very soon. For now, I'll send it back over to Gary at JSC. Hey, thanks, Yome. Teams in Houston continue to watch the countdown of NASA's SpaceX CRS-30 mission, and everything's looking good. This will be the fourth launch to the International Space Station. In okay, I'm back real quick. Uh, I guess I'm just listening <laughs> on headphones now. Uh, I don't know what happened. But uh, I did want to mention, this is the 30th launch of CRS. Um, I was at CRS-3. Uh, that was the first launch I ever went to in 2014. 14. That's crazy. 10 years ago. I don't know why that just shocks me, but um, yeah, I just wanted to say that this is like reminiscent for me. And it was a similar time of year though. I feel like it was even like March or April. Um, yeah, I'm having like nostalgia overload right now. And it's even at Slick 40 and everything. So this is this is really cool. That's all I wanted to say. Let's listen in. Four tons of supplies. And the Progress spacecraft launched from Kazakhstan with another three tons of supplies a few weeks later. A cadre of four spacefarers once again launched from U.S. soil on NASA's SpaceX Crew-8 mission. Their arrival began a six-month expedition on station and relieved the Crew-7 quartet from their half-year stay aboard, who undocked and splashed down off the coast of Florida shortly after Crew-8's arrival. And around the corner, we're gearing up for the first crewed flight of the Boeing Starliner on a mission to verify the spacecraft for transporting crew to and from the International Space Station and add this vehicle to the American fleet of human-rated spacecraft. 
While progress continues to be made in low Earth orbit, NASA continues to aim for the moon. The Artemis II crew has been preparing for their critical demonstration flight aboard Orion with training in Houston, Cape Canaveral, and off the coast of San Diego for recovery operations. Their mission, a giant leap to humanity's sustained presence on the lunar surface. I'm realizing that I'm probably going to get copyright strikes for the music in this, but isn't it insane that there is literally the people that are going to the moon again for the first time since 1972 are actually like in front of us now? This is really exciting. I, I love that. Artemis, Artemis 2 is going to be so fun. Definitely want to be there for that one for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, train alongside astronauts from many nations continuing scientific discovery, exploration, and inspiration together for humanity. Continuing scientific discovery is enabled by missions like today. Dragon's oh, about God, to bring up three tons of cargo, much of which includes scientific hardware and samples. The microgravity environment of the space station not only allows for a unique perspective from which to observe physical and biological phenomenon, but it serves as a test bed for improving technologies and capabilities that can send us farther into the solar system and advance our lives right here on Earth. The science portfolio inside Dragon right now includes Stage all of this one, enabled by scientists complete. and engineers who have been working for months, sometimes years, to prepare for this moment, a launch to the International Space Station. Here are some highlights of what's inside Dragon today. SpaceX is set. All right, more music. Let's see if we can, uh, let's see, uh, from Walter, does, this, does the cargo Dragon have seats still mounted in it just in case it's needed as a lifeboat? No, because don't forget, it doesn't have... Uh, it doesn't have life support either, so it wouldn't be a very good lifeboat. Um, however, I don't remember. It, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I actually feel like there was actually some. Um, there was something that, some way that it could be used, but it was like really weird. Does I don't know if I'm making that up. Why? Why do I feel like there was somewhere where it's like, and if you used a suit, blah blah blah, you know, ha, da 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 do ba dee. But I don't remember. Uh, that doesn't sound right to me. Uh, let's go back to more questions. Um, this is from um, Paula Messina. Is the cargo in the capsule or in the trunk or both? How do they get stuff out of the trunk? Spacewalk. Great question. Good good name for a podcast, Spacewalk. Um, I like it. So there is cargo in both. So if it's going inside the International Space Station, it's inside the capsule. If it's being affixed to the outside, then it's going to be in the trunk. So in the hollow part that you see below the capsule section. And that's normally taken out by the Canada arm or Canada arm. Um, and that literally reaches in there, grabs stuff. And then sometimes, you know, it's, it can either be directly attached or needs, you know, to have an astronaut uh, actually go and attach something on a spacewalk. But that's, yeah, let's listen in here. And the strong back for recline away from Falcon 9. At that transporter erector, which is that large truss structure to the left of Falcon 9, is what will retract, strongback is retracting. in preparation for liftoff. And you heard that call out that the strongback is retracting. You can see those clamp arms opening just below Dragon as well. In just a few seconds, you should see that strongback recline away from Falcon 9 and Dragon. Strongback there you can see the strongback slowly leaning away from Falcon 9 and Dragon. Over to you, Gary. That's right, after strongback retract, we're still counting down, about to approach 3 minutes 30 seconds to launch. At this time, the fuel and oxidizer inside the first stage are f fully fueled. Fuel inside the second stage is al already at max capacity, and we're just topping off the liquid uh, oxygen on the second stage, which should wrap up topping about T minus two minutes. Now again, we're green, we're tracking good weather, 90% go, uh, beautiful skies there at the Kennedy Space Center and uh, sp uh, Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Now, for some reason, we do not launch today. There is a backup opportunity tomorrow, March 22nd, 4.29 p.m. Eastern. 
I did want to point out, yeah, it's crystal clear skies. And don't forget, this is a return to launch site landing. So the booster will be landing quite close to where it took off from, just a, a few kilometers away on the Cape there. Uh, so we should get incredible views coming back down, which I'm extremely excited about. Um, I wanted to answer this question quick from John. Why are there so many resupply companies when the ISS is about to be decommissioned in the not too distant future? Well, there's still people on board the International Space Station um, and they need supplies. So these are mostly like a lot of this is just literally food and uh, and items for the crew that's on board the International Space Station. So there will have to be resupply missions to resupply those uh, those consumables um, and also just, you know, send experiments up, do all the things that it needs to do. Um, there's still that. There will always be that. Uh, they will be pro providing support as long as there's humans on board and until it's decommissioned. So um, it's not like they're necessarily adding to it. Of course, like I said, they're adding some cameras to this, uh, but that's relatively, you know, there's relatively small things being done at this point. Uh, but let's listen in here. Stage two locks have just completed. So we are within two minutes here, guys, coming up for what looks like a beautiful launch. Control have passed. We'll get to uh, engine gibbling and wiggle test on the first stage much closer before ignition. At the time of launch, the International Space Station will be flying 260 statue Ground miles over the border out. of Mexico and Guatemala. Hey, this is cool. We have someone in chat whose school is watching the stream right now, launching our experiment, have been working on it, f on it for a few years. That is awesome, the landing zone. Congratulations. Can't wait to see your experiment go up in space. Very, very cool. Uh, yeah, we'll get to your guys' questions here after starting at T minus one minute. I'm basically going to shut up uh, and listen in, and then I'll answer your questions after stage separation and stuff and pop in for a little bit. But good luck, SpaceX. Pointy end up, flaming end down. That check is done. And uh, go NASA, go SpaceX, go Falcon 9, go Dragon. Let's do this. Is in countdown. Range remains go for launch, waiting for that final go from the SpaceX launch director. SpaceX launch director, go for launch. You heard that call out. The launch director has given that final go. All systems are go for launch of Falcon 9 in the CRS-30 mission. SpaceX 30th Commercial Resupply Services Mission. Falcon 9 at 1.7 million pounds of thrust. Pitching down range, hearing good calls of performance. Nominal trajectory as Falcon 9 and Dragon arc out to the northeast. Beautiful tracking shot. Falcon 9 has successfully lifted off from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. And during ascent, we will tilt our gimbal our engines, guiding the rocket into what we call a gravity turn. Through this turn, the vehicle is flying both up and horizontally, horizontally away from the launch pad. Now, this rocket typically needs to go about 17,500 miles per hour horizontally in order to make it to orbit and avoid being pulled back down to Earth. So moments ago, we did throttle the engines down in preparation for max Q, or maximum aerodynamic pressure, in just a couple seconds. Guys, this could be, with, with skies this clear, this might be some of the all-time tracking footage, because don't forget, NASA typically does put up uh, raw, isolated views. But, yep, we're coming up here on, on Miko and stage separation. So let's tune in. Second engine start up one, and the start of the boost back burn for the first stage. And back is chilling. There's the call out. The MVAC engine on the second stage is chilling in, getting ready for startup. Now, the first of these events is ma main engine cutoff, or MECO, where the nine Merlin 1D engines on the first stage will shut down in preparation for stage separation, which is where stage one and two will separate from each other with the first stage making its way back down to Earth and the second stage uh, performing second engine start one which is where we ignite that single Merlin vacuum engine on board the second stage. 
Now the boost back burn will then start on the first stage. This burn helps assist the vehicle flip back around and reorient, reorient itself back to land. Mika is starting in just a couple seconds. There we go. Oh, that's a cool shot. A little out of Mika. focus. Stage separation confirmed. Beautiful. Get it in focus because that's insane. There you heard and saw those events happening back to back. Awesome views of the first stage flipping back around as it performs its boost back burn. Again, we had main engine cutoff of the first stage, stage separation, second engine start on the second stage, and that first stage doing the awesome flip as it starts its boost back burn. Now this burn is a little under a minute, so we have about 20 seconds left in this burn. And about three minutes after that, we will have two additional burns on the first stage to prepare to land back at landing zone one at Cape Canaveral. We are at T plus three minutes and 30 seconds here in today's mission. CRS-30 is SpaceX's- Stage one boost back shutdown. There is that confirmation for the boost back shutdown of Both the first stage. And a nominal trajectory. And a nominal trajectory. As again, CRS-30 is SpaceX's 27th launch this year. And we are coming up on the entry burn of the first stage, as well as second engine cutoff. On those live views of the first stage, you can see the attitude control system creating those beautiful puffs of white gas. And that's nitrogen from the cold gas thrusters of the attitude control system. This is gonna be incredible tracking footage. And around T plus six minutes and 30 seconds, you should see on your screen the first stage's entry burn. And for the entry burn, we relight three of the M1D engines on the first stage, starting with the center engine nine, followed shortly by engines one and five, which slows the vehicle down as it passes back into the Earth's atmosphere. And we need to slow down to reduce re-entry forces, which helps us to recover and reuse the first stage. <laughs> The second stage on the right, you can see beautiful views of the Earth in the background and that Merlin vacuum engine heating up as it performs its burn. You can see Florida there still. That's crazy on the right. On the left, we should see the peninsula coming and the Cape coming back up into view soon too. We are a little over a minute to the start of our first stage entry burn. You can see the first stage on those live views on your left with two of the four hypersonic grid fins deployed, helping steer that first stage down as it makes its way back home to Earth. Yeah, grid fins won't be doing much yet at, at over 100 kilometers in altitude, but especially I after the entry the burn. Telemetry on the bottom. After the entry burns, when you really see the grid fins start to do a lot more because that's when it's in a, a thicker part of the atmosphere. So um, the grid fins are so fun to watch because they can do so much and hopefully they get, you know, Starship's super heavy booster grid fins kind of all dialed in here for the next one. And the first stage is coming back down towards the Earth's atmosphere with the altitude decreasing. Really cool views from the attitude control system of the first stage. Yeah, that's awesome. I love seeing those puffs. Just about 20 seconds from the start of our first stage entry burn. We should be able yeah. to see really cool views of... They appear to have some kind of digital crop tracking system that's not quite working on that tracker. It's trying to keep it nice and centered, but it looks like it's occasionally bouncing back and forth. But it, when it looks like it's stable, it's incredible. So if it was stable and in focus, this is going to be the best tracking views ever. There's the cape. Stage one, entry burn startup. There is the start of the stage one entry burn. And this is a three engine burn on the first stage of Falcon 9. That looks like just one so far. Oh, it was three. Stage Normally it's one entry burn shut down. Kind there of as long as the line. Really cool views of the end of the first stage entry burn and oh. the flight. Stage is nominal trajectory. 
and the call outs for nominal trajectory and the flight termination system being saved. Now the first stage that is supporting today's mission will be, has just performed this entry burn for the sixth time. Falcon 9 is the world's first orbital class reusable rocket and this allows SpaceX to refly the most expensive parts of the rocket, which in turn drives Stage down one, transonic. drives down the cost of access to space. Now uh, coming up, we have that landing focus. burn starting in just a few moments. <laughs> yes. There is the start of Stage one landing burn. Start of that landing burn. Really cool view of Cape Canaveral coast. Yes. Stage one landing. Line. Oh, that is. Wow. Wow. Wonderful views of that first stage landing. Stage landing Back at landing zone one. Looking pristine there. And there you have it. That landing marks SpaceX's 286 recovery of an orbital class rocket, including the first stage landings for Falcon stage 9. Stage 2 FTS has saved. And heavy. You heard that call out that stage 2 FTS is safe, getting ready for second engine cutoff here in just under 10 seconds. Wow. That was. Those tracking guys are getting a lot of practice lately, guys and gals. So obviously we do expect to continue to get better and better yeah, footage like that. There we go. Seco. There is that second engine cutoff with the MVAC shutdown call ice. out. Waiting Before you ask what that is, that's ice. A good orbital insertion. Orbit insertion. There is that confirmation of good orbit. It looks like we are on track for Dragon separation in just a few minutes, just before the T plus 12 minute mark. If you guys want to know why why it's always ice, look at the end of these valves, like right by, kind of in the middle of the engine. Any of the vents, you know, it's venting uh, really cold, gaseous oxygen most of the time here, or sometimes it could be, you know, depending on, there's also helium on board and, and nitrogen, but when it enters, you know, and reaches the vacuum of space, it, lots of times it'll just freeze completely, skipping, uh, liquefying, just going straight to a solid, basically. I don't remember what that's called. And you'll just get these chunks of, of ice there building up on the ends of those vents. Um, and so sometimes those can build up and, and make weird shapes as it conforms to the engine and stuff like that. And then during shutdown, all of a sudden it breaks free. So that's what we saw, that like weird strand-looking block of ice. Really cool. Stage. And in addition to flying cargo to support crew on board the space station, SpaceX also enables researchers the opportunity to fly critical science to orbit on Dragon, which has carried over 1,000 research experiments to and from low Earth orbit and the International Space Station since 2012. Enabling research in space paves the way for us to explore beyond Earth and make life multiplanetary. And like I said, guys, don't forget, after Dragon deploying stuff, we'll answer a, few, a handful of your questions here. We got a nice little queue of some really good questions. So be sure and be asking good questions. We'll, we're gonna watch for Dragon deployment. And then we got time to answer questions. So if you have any questions, now's a good time. About two and a half minutes into flight, and that was followed by a successful landing of Falcon 9's first stage at landing zone one back in Cape Canaveral, Florida. That was the sixth landing for that particular Falcon 9 first stage. And for those of you following along, this Dragon capsule has also supported CRS-22, CRS-24, and CRS-27, which were three additional cargo resupply missions to the International Space Station. At about T plus eight and a half minutes, we had a successful second engine cutoff, followed by confirmation of a good orbital insertion. The vehicle is now coasting with... Okay, so yeah, uh, deposition is what you guys are letting me know. Um, and the, like I said, it skips over freezing again because it, it it's already venting. So that what's being vented out is in gaseous form. It reaches the vacuum of space and basically instantly turns into a solid. So it skips back over freezing, uh, which I believe is depositions. Deposition. Cool. Or resublimation. Mm. Just a few seconds from payload deployment. Bye, Dragon. You can see Dragon floating away there. It's 
Very exciting to see. Dragon is drifting away from Falcon 9 second stage there, confirming good spacecraft separation. As SpaceX is honored to be a part of NASA's commercial resupply services initiative to deliver critical cargo to the space station. And we thank NASA for entrusting us with today's mission. For those of you following along, you'll know that this mission marks our 27th of the year. Congratulations to the SpaceX team. We're just in March and we're already launched in partnership with NASA missions like Axiom 3, Cygnus, and PACE, Intuitive Machines, Crew A, and more. You can check SpaceX.com slash launches for up-to-date missions and schedules. But that will do it for me here in Hawthorne. But I'm handing it over to Gary to take us through nose Dragon Nose Cone opening. Gary? That's awesome. So we will wait in here for the Dragon Nose Cone to deploy. Uh, not really anything that probably needs too much commentary. <laughs> We've got some good questions here from you guys that I really wanted to talk about here. And the first one is John Lynch. Tim, what are your thoughts on IFT3? Well, good news for you, John. Uh, I said it at the beginning, if you want to know all my thoughts on IFT3, I promise we'll go right back to the stream here. Uh, be sure, though, find this podcast. I just started a new podcast called Spacewalk. I have 22 minutes of my thoughts on IFT3. So instead of wasting time here on air, uh, go ahead and check that out. Uh, it's I promise you'll, you'll hear plenty about IFT3 in the third flight of Starship. Uh, Spacewalk Podcast, find it wherever you're listening to podcasts or on this YouTube channel here at Spacewalk Podcast on YouTube. Find it, subscribe, download it, enjoy. Let's listen in here and see if we're going to get anything else from, from this. By Dragon, that the Expedition 70 crew aboard station is awaiting. We did receive word that there is a fresh food kit, including some fruits and vegetables like citrus, apples, and cherry tomatoes inside Dragon right now. There's also two crew requested coffee kits and 60, that's six zero, bulk overwrap bags. These are standard bobs containing some standard um, food menu items as well as some crew preference choices. So there's a lot of the stuff. Okay, so let's, so this is from Mitch. Good to hear from you, Mitch. We miss your smiling face at the KSC press that I do hope to make it back out there for another launch here. Maybe this year, uh, there's a handful of exciting missions that I'd, that I'd like to make it out for. It is kind of a, you know, a, quite the trek and quite the journey to stream from there these days, but I do miss it a lot. I love the Cape. I haven't been out there. I don't think I've been out for launch since Artemis 1. That's kind of crazy. This is from Colby King. How much fuel does the first stage need to land back at the pad? I did some rough cal calculations and got extremely varied results from 14 to 105 tons. So it depends on the mission. So if it's a return to launch site mission, it's roughly 30% of the fuel needed during, 30% uh, of the first stage's propellant uh, is needed to be able to do the boost back and the reentry burn. If they're landing downrange, it's roughly 15%. These, these days it might be a little bit better than that. It might be more like, um, you know, 25 and 12 or something or around there, but it's roughly in that, that realm. So uh, just, you can do the math on how heavy uh, the booster is uh, and to kind of get a sense of, of how much actual propellant. Um, yeah. Blake Van Hayden wants to know, if I had another chance to interview Elon, what would you like to ask him most? You know, the best thing about when Elon does interviews about SpaceX and, and rockets is just getting the, the tea on, on what's new and what's different. And what, I mean, he, when he's in that mode of talking about this stuff and when he's dialed into it, I mean, there's no better person to ask, honestly. Um, Especially like when he was out there a lot, you know, before when that one was at 2021 and 2022 is that, I mean, the guy just was living and breathing out there. Uh, these days it doesn't feel like he's, he's as involved with SpaceX and kind of more involved with, you know, other projects. Uh, so I don't know if he'd be as plugged in right now as, as he was. And I would probably prefer to, to honestly talk to like Gwen is out there a lot now. She's at Starbase. She's probably a lot more dialed in and. Frankly, I would just like to hear her updates on, you know, changes. That's what I like is like what, you know, what went wrong with the last one, the improvements and stuff like that. I talk again and I talk about some of those things in my podcast. So again, Spacewalk Podcast, find it. It's free, totally free. Just find it. I'm just trying to make more casual content for you guys. Um, 
but yeah, we talk about that quite a bit, and there's quite a few speculations right now that I would really like to have answered. Um, I would love to interview Gwen to add to the the growing list of uh, awesome people that I've had the honor of, of talking to. Um, this is from Blake, wants to know, when can we expect a Starship model? I get that question quite a bit, and frankly, we're we're a long ways away from start. It took us almost 18 months to go from prototype, or like from paper and the idea of, of trying to build the model to actually producing and having it d delivered. If it would take another 18 months to do another Starship model, um, or to do a Starship model, by then Starship will change so much that it won't even be anything like what we're seeing. We will do a Starship model someday. Um, the next ones we're doing, though, for models are actually, we're going smaller because we want to try to potentially, you know, get these to be lower cost and add to your guys' collection and make it um, hopefully really, really cool. I don't know if, how many of you have seen this, but these are the original, just kind of the mold prototypes um, for our next ones. This is so fun. This, speaking of the Cape Canaveral, this, this is a scale size of the Redstone, Mercury Redstone. This is what we just saw land to the same freaking scale. How insane is that? Are you kidding me? That this, this is what first took, uh, you know, uh, uh, oh my gosh, why am I blanking on Gus Grissom and uh, Alan Shepard? Holy crap, it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a long day. This is what first took uh, US astronauts to space, just above the Kármán line. And this is what took them into orbit, same capsule, uh, but with the uh, the Atlas rocket. So uh, what's cool about the Atlas rocket, I don't know if you guys know this, but the Atlas rocket has a uh, detachable booster engine. So instead of staging the whole thing and, and lighting another engine, they that was considered kind of risky at the time. So they actually detached these two engines and left it with the sustainer engine uh, in order to get into orbit. So basically if they hadn't detached these engines, it wouldn't have had any kind of pay meaningful payload to orbit. So that was their way of like, once they didn't need these engines, they detached them exactly like this in the same frame and everything we did i'm really excited these are the engines that gimbaled um really really cool so just to see the scale again you know compared to even a dragon capsule compared to the mercury capsule same scale i get a kick out of that that's that's why we went with these for the next ones just because like it's so fun to see things throughout history uh to the same scale we just don't often get to see that um so that's why that's why we chose to do um the Mercury program for our next ones because I just think it's I just think it's really cool, uh, given it gives an appreciation for both what they did with uh, stuff back then, but also for what we're doing today. You know, people don't think of, you know, the Dragon capsule as that big of a and uh, that big of a spacecraft, and they don't think of the Falcon Nine as that big of a rocket. But it's actually quite big. It's actually quite big, um, and of course those would be metal and painted, um, you know, to be to the same quality as as what you guys are used to with these the metal Falcon Nines. Um, but I love that. So yeah, someday we will be doing, um, the, the, of course, we'll be doing Starship to the same scale. That's why I chose 1100. And actually, right here, people were asking, you know, why, why didn't you do 172 or 144, I think are the common. But right here is literally why I did 1100, because this is about as small of a rocket as I want anywhere near my life. If it was any smaller, it'd be a pencil and I'd lose it. Um, if it was a bigger scale, like 172, Starship would be freaking huge so 1 100 not only just makes sense you can look at this and go oh just multiply any dimension by 100 and you know the size um but also it's just the right scale for small things and for starship because when we make a 1 100 scale starship that's going to be in, you know ridiculous so it'll be it'll be a while we're going to do other models i think after this we might go into uh the space shuttle maybe um or and or buran i would love to have those two side by side oh I want that so bad. Most of these are for me. Like, I'm, I'm making these for me, and then we're making enough of them that, <laughs> that you guys can have them too. Uh, that's frankly how it's going, but I've always wanted to have all, of, all of these rockets to the same scale. Someday we'll do a small a small sat launcher. Like, we'll do Electron. Maybe we could do a package. I know we'd have to get uh, sign-off from all the companies. Like, if we did Alpha, uh, Electron, um, you know, who else is, you know, ABL or, you know, whoever else has a small sat launcher. Or Falcon 9, or Falcon 1, I mean. Seeing them all to scale would be really, really, really fun. So that's that's why we're doing it that size. Yeah. Uh, when is Artemis 2 scheduled to fly? Currently, what was, is it August 2025? So we have about a year and a half still, uh, if I recall. How do they uh, avoid collisions like Starlink satellites? Well, they track everything and they know. Uh, so 
the shell of Starlink is more or less at a you know fixed altitude of, of above the International Space Station, um, and so on ascent you're always starting off below. You're starting even when you're um, even when you're going to like a geostationary orbit, you park first in a in a much lower Earth orbit. Lower Earth. No, notice I said lower Earth. That's it's not lower Earth orbit, but in this case it is a lower orbit of the Earth, but it's a low low Earth orbit. Um, and then they they kind of just know timing wise and things to ha know how to avoid a collision. Uh, on the way out. So let's see. Oh, cool. Jerome says his brother is there live. I hope your your brother had an incredible view. I mean, boost back burn, landing burn looked absolutely phenomenal. Very, very fun. Um, let's see here. Uh, this is from Moving On says, I miss Ludicrous Life. I'm guessing you mean our Ludicrous Future. Yeah, a lot of people miss that, which is why I'm trying to do a podcast again, because people miss just that casual chit chat. Um, I miss it too. I miss those guys. But like I said, and I made a trailer for the, the podcast and I said in 2021, I was gone almost 300 days of 2021. So scheduling it with other people and being in a situation where I have good enough internet and all of the things necessary to do a live, like face or, you know, live over zoom podcast with other people just became really, really hard and really, really stressful. And people were always like, well, we just want to hear you. You know, we just want to hear your thoughts on things. And I'm like, I want that too. Like I want to make more content. I don't like that I'm always traveling and that we're producing longer and longer, you know, higher quality videos. Um, I So I'm kind of always focusing this main channel on having the highest quality things, but I want to have quantity over quality for, for the podcast. So the podcast is just super chill. It's just me talking to you about like this, uh, but with your questions coming in there and we're trying to kind of fix to more or less a topic and then kind of going through people's questions. So that first episode is just about flight three of Starship. Um, next episode's up to you guys. You guys get to choose by using hashtag uh, spacewalk podcast. And you know, this way it's just, it's just a way for me to really easily produce content, no video. So we don't even have to do much editing. It can be up and out within, you know, within a day of shooting it, uh, recording. So it should be really, really, really easy. Um, uh, let's see here. Oh man, this is a, a tricky one. My guess for an ETA to Mars, as in Oh, I still think, no, 2030 for humans on Mars is still too soon. Um, I used to think 2030, by 2030. I'm starting to think now we might see an uncrewed, if Starship goes really well, if Starship gets to doing refueling, if Starship can land on Earth, re-entry and propulsively land on Earth, and if it can fully refuel, frankly, I could see them sending a Starship to Mars just to try it. And in theory, that could be in the next couple of years. I wouldn't be surprised if it's more like four years. But we might see an uncrewed Starship go to Mars to, to just try it by 2030. But I'd say over probably likely more like 10 years for any chance of humans. Uh, there has to be a lot of infrastructure on Mars. And also, like, I'm starting to think, you know, all these companies that are interconnected, that Elon's interconnected with, with Tesla and SpaceX... Um, you know, with Tesla with obviously like electric motors, but now especially with their bot they're trying to produce, um, you know, Optimus Prime, if, if that can, wait, is it actually called Optimus Prime or just Optimus? I forget. Did I just add Prime in there? Cause I'm used to it. Um, but it's, that could be what they send to Mars first to help set up infrastructure. If there's a humanoid robot, that's, you know, if they get that kind of figured out in the next two, three years, just send 50 of those to Mars and let them do stuff. If, if, if three quarters of them break, who cares? And it would be so cheap. Let them just get there, start setting up, you know, solar panels and do all the things that, that humans would normally do and then get it all prepared. Just Optimus bot. There we go. <laughs> um, and with a vehicle like Starship, if they really did land a Starship on Mars, holy crap. Talk about down mass. You know, they could land hundreds of tons on the surface of Mars or hundred tons on the surface of Mars. Um, I think that'd be really, really cool. Uh, thank you so much to Theme Park Rob for becoming a member. Much, much appreciated. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do I have any in-depth videos or interviews due soon? Both, James. Good to hear from you, James. Um, yeah, both. Uh, in the next couple weeks, hopefully, we'll have a really, really, really cool video uh, where I visited two European uh, rocket companies and we compare them, we compare and contrast them. It's RFA, Rocket Factory Augsburg, and ESAR Aerospace. And we basically are like showing, it's so fun because they're two very different companies, but we're going back and forth uh, between the interviews 
and the, the tours. Um, that's going to be the next video out. Uh, then I'll be down for the, the eclipse. That might take some time. And then I've got another thing at the end of the month. But the other video that I'm working on too is part two of why don't they just use, you know, jet engines. And this will be why don't you use jet engines on a rocket booster. Jet engines, scramjet, ramjet engines on a, you know, on a rocket booster or a first stage. I think they're closing out here already. Wow. Crazy. Um, yeah, so that's going to be a really, really fun video too. Uh, it's It was basically done when I split, and then I split that video up into three parts. So we're redoing a lot of stuff that we're getting even more details, uh, you know, more numbers, more charts, more all the fun things. Um, and I'm really, really excited for that one. So that'll be the next like big produced video will be, you know, why don't you use jet engines on a rocket booster to assist, you know, to aid and boost the, the rocket booster. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's that one. Um, so there, there's, and then there's another one over, I mean, there's, there's, yeah, there's literally like four videos in the works at the moment. So there's a lot of stuff going on and then also a lot of travel in the next month and a half. But, um, that's why we have, that's why we have spacewalk. That's why we have spacewalk right there. So you guys can just get casual things. So be sure you're subscribed there. Be sure you find it on your favorite podcast thing. I'll stop talking about it for now. No, I won't. Um, but I do think this is important because I think a lot of people just want to have that. I get it asked for it all the time. So I want to make sure that people that ask me for this know it's out there. So I might be annoying until people realize that, yes, it's done. From Tactical Coffee Drinker, uh, is IFT, is there an IFT4 launch date confirmed? There isn't a confirmation on Starship launches until about th four days beforehand, ever. Um, Gwen Shed, Gwen Shed, Gwen Shotwell said uh, that it'd be about six weeks. I think it'll, you know, I'm guessing May at this point would be reasonable. Uh, there will be another, you know, we do have to wait for another FAA license. Um, but that's, uh, so speaking of that, the advanced forward says, where, where is that? Uh, speaking of, um, saying advanced forward question. I believe the FAA is intentionally unfairly delaying Starship for several reason. Well, yeah, that's a statement, but my question is, What's your next Starship launch date prediction? Okay, so that's exactly what we're talking about. I don't think that I don't think they're delaying it. They just need to do due diligence. This is a vehicle that is so big, overflying. Don't forget, if if the second stage burn had been between what happened for IFT two and IFT three, so let's say IFT two had burned for twenty more seconds and then lost touch and had to blow up, that the whole entire upper stage would have landed somewhere in Africa, like over potentially populated areas. Um, the FAA has a duty to make sure that the public is safe, that public and property are safe. Um, now, however, obviously Starship is proving to be able to do the things that it needs to do and they're doing it carefully. And they are trying to figure out if the FAA can change their license instead of every single launch to be kind of like a group of launches. Like, hey, here's this flight profile. Here's what we're trying to do assuming it doesn't go outside of its exclusion zones and the things that, you know, like what has happened for IFT2 and IFT3 were all by the books. You know, it, it they were terminated and everything happened within its its bounds, these predetermined bounds, and was done safely. Same with IFT3. So therefore, I, there's talks of the FAA trying to make it kind of like they can wave and, and rush a license or, you know, do a batch of license for this flight profile we approve of. Assuming that there isn't, you know, a flight where it deviates outside of these exclusion zones or something, or doesn't do something that would uh, endanger uh, the public. Uh, and I agree with that. I think that'd be a good way to go about when when we do have a vehicle like this, it's kind of doing the same thing over and over until they figure it out. Um, that's, yeah, that's that. Uh, let's see, Juan says, uh, ISS is almost 400 kilometers high. What is the altitude for Dragon to separate from stage two? Well, we could have seen that here. Let me see if we can see the exact altitude when it separates. Um, it is roughly, give me a second here. It's 200 kilometers more or less when it separates and then the Dragon spacecraft raises its orbit. Um, they do that to, to do phasing. So actually if you want to catch up to the International Space Station, um, you actually have to be below it. So your altitude, uh, so you're you're physically moving faster but also your, your radius is faster, you know, it's smaller too. So you will catch up to the International Space Station then you raise and align your phases and all this really cool stuff. Um, 
This is from, uh, oh cool, from T TFA Soul. I watched the most recent OLF today, or podcast yesterday at work. It was great. Excited to watch a new podcast later today. And people have been asking, you know, so far we've done maybe one or two OLFs a year, just kind of reunion ones. We totally still plan to do that. Um, you, you, If you watched the last reunion, we tried getting together for like six weeks. It is just very, very hard to do with, with three other people. Um, a lot of it's my fault, but some of it was Joe's fault also travels a lot. Um and and just as ha he's got a very busy production schedule as well, so it's just hard to get the three of us together. Frankly, it was a big, it was actually a really big sacrifice to to be able to do it every Thursday um, when we were doing it. And you know, I love again, I love it, and I I miss it too. Um, but it, it was a it was a big commitment, and that's kind of the idea with spacewalk. It's just like no commitment, no like we can literally just do it while going, while in the car, while you know, wherever and just record locally and then send that tiny file because it's just audio. There's no video. Uh, there's not big edit times. There's not big upload times. I can be using a hotspot on my phone to upload a video to Spencer to edit. No big deal. Uh, let's see. This is from um, Oded. Did, what, uh, did, do I know anything about the MS-25 abort? No, I wasn't paying attention to that, unfortunately. I uh, We've been working today on other things and then I was working on this live stream, so I, I actually did not pay any attention to the MS-25 aboard, but it sounded like it was, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, I don't remember what it actually was. I did read what it was, but now I don't remember. Um, let's see, this is from Ian. They are going to have a human rated starship fly empty to the moon, dock with Artemis, very dangerous, then land them on the moon. Does anyone else think this is stupid? I think it's I think it's silly, frankly, to if Artemis has to if the human landing system has to go from low Earth orbit to the moon anyway, why not just send crew up in low Earth orbit on Dragon capsule, dock with dock in low Earth orbit, then do your translunar injection. To me, that's safer. I agree. It'd be kind of scarier to dock way out at the moon if there is any kind of issue. You're a lot further out. Um. I don't, I, I, this infrastructure is clearly making a reason for, for SLS and, and Orion to still exist. Although it is the only thing that can physically take humans to the moon right now. Once there are the human landing systems, of course they have to get themselves out to the moon and they're human rated. It is just a bit cumbersome. Um, it is a bit cumbersome and it is a bit weird. Um, let's see, let's keep going. Um, Phoenix, we don't really know more of what happened on IFT3 yet. Um, hopefully we'll get more details. But again, I do talk about that stuff for 20-some minutes uh, in my podcast. So be sure and listen. <laughs> I'm going to be annoying. I'm already annoying. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what about that shuttle versus uh, Energia Baran video? Yes, that is another one that we're literally having the pipe. We have a lot that we're editing, a lot that we're working on. Um, and of course, everything kind of got put on pause for for uh, for IFT three for the third flight of Starship. That you know that took about a week before uh, leading up to it, tearing down, resetting, uh, editing that that compilation together just chews up about a week. So unfortunately, every time there's one of those launches, it is uh, quite cumbersome. Uh, oh, this is awesome from Moose. Three years, three months, seven days as a member slash supporter. Got to learn and watch so much over the years. Senior growth is awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate the ongoing support. Uh, it, yeah, it's obviously what makes all of this possible. And I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be streaming and doing this stuff if you guys weren't all here watching and hanging out with me anyway. So uh, this is as much for, it's, it's as much for me because you guys are here uh, as anything else. So having you all here to watch and hang out with me uh, is, is literally what makes it happen. So that and the support is awesome. Much, much appreciated. Uh, let's see here. Uh, by the way, yeah, the, the podcast, yes, we we stuck it to the comments for the YouTube channel. And that YouTube channel, the link has all of the other. If you want to watch on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever, uh, you can find it just by searching Everyday Astronaut or searching um, Spacewalk. So do that. Um yeah, agree, Tony. The booster shots, return shots, blew my mind too. Those were absolutely incredible. Loved it. Um, do I think recovering both Super Heavy and Starship this year is achievable? I think that uh, soft recovery, like splashing down, yes. I think I expect the booster to to 
splash down softly next time, I think it'll be, you know, recoverable. And that's, you know what I mean? Like not reused and not like actually landing back at the pad um, for the next one. But I think the next one we will see the booster landing. I think hopefully we see return and or we see soft splash down or belly flop safe one piece uh, return of Starship on the next one too. That'd be awesome. Uh, there's a chance that we might see Booster attempting to return to the launch site and land in Chopsticks this year. And that would be the coolest thing ever, ever, ever. But, uh, yeah, that will be one that we will not want to miss for anything. That will be the coolest freaking video. And imagine that tracking shot. Watching the super heavy Booster come back down and then land inside the Chopstick arms will be the craziest thing ever. I can't that I can't wait for that. That's going to be absolutely insane. Uh, but that's yeah, that's gonna do it for me, guys. I'm gonna work on getting out of here. Got more to do tonight. Uh, we got a debrief with our team about IFT3, how it went, and I'm really excited for that because we did awesome. I was really happy with our system. We had only like one problem, and that was my mic. And I, ironically, actually, we have a new box unit that was coming in that day that we were planning to replace anyway for that certain unit. Just you know, luck of the draw, whatever. Uh, it's going to be a fun debrief and got more work to do tonight. And then hopefully, like I said, guys, we'll have some more content for you coming out here, uh, soon. And, uh, the eclipse coming up, total solar eclipse. It's going to be awesome. Uh, launch recap in our discord wants to know if there's a discount code in the store today. There is not, but don't forget we do have, uh, 50, we still have 50% off 50, not 15, 50, five, zero percent off of some of our classic shirts, uh, like our F1 shirt, our Aerospike shirt. Norman Ulti, uh, full flow stage combustion cycle hoodie, a lot of awesome, awesome shirts. Some are selling out, um, but there's still a few more that are in here. Yeah, stuff is selling out, so you better get on it before it's gone. There are multiple pages, don't forget. Uh, a lot of youth stuff, too, so if you have kids, or if you already have some of these, buy a backup. You know, I have, like, literally three of all my favorite shirts, so that if one of them, if I wear it too much or too often. Um, so, yeah, go everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Take 50% off by the red section, but also don't forget to check out our new stuff. Uh, we've got uh, we've got the new orbital shirt, which I absolutely am obsessed with because it has a chart here for different orbital velocities. New Mars hat, the ISS cupola umbrella. And by the way, I think we loaded up this. In, this video is so cool. Look at what Spencer Spencer made this video. It's awesome. The cupola, one of the coolest things in the International Space Station. Boom, cupola umbrella. That is. Allie is genius for that one. That's like the coolest. That and the heat shield marker, like two of the coolest things we have in our shop. Anyway, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. I'll shut up now. Uh, find the thing. Um, yeah, there you go, guys. Uh, find the podcast. Oh, there's one more. Uh, Mr. All Electric Car Lunacy says, uh, feel like they need to test the chopsticks like those practice combat dummies in Witcher, not the full-up ones. I think, honestly, if they can... If they can already handle, and if the booster, you know, so softly splashes down, controlled, I see no reason. And, you know, if they right on target, I see no reason why they wouldn't just try it in real life. That's me. All right. That's going to do it for me. Uh, thank you all so much for hanging out. Congrats, SpaceX and NASA on another flawless mission. Uh, that's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dowd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Goodbye, everybody. Oh, check out my podcast, Spacewalk Podcast. <laughs> I told you I'm going to sneak it in. Bye, everybody.